Hi, my name's Sarah Watson and I am Reader in Gothic Studies at Lancaster University and today I'm going to talk to you a bit about Daphne du Maurier's novel Rebecca and share some activities that you might enjoy doing. <clears throat> so this work is going to be quite ambitious. It's also a kind of taster session of the kind of work that you would do if you chose to study English at university with us or anywhere else. So it's ambitious, but also straightforward. And so I hope you'll find it satisfying um, and en enjoy this challenge. So we're going to talk about a few things. I'll say a little bit about Daphne du Maurier. I'll talk about literary antecedents and canonicity, which are really useful in thinking about situating the novel in terms of literary history. We'll be singling striking literary features, and we'll be considering the novel's social context, including gender representation and class. And at the end, we'll consider some key entry points for adaptations or sequels, and you can have some creative fun with that yourselves. So Daphne du Maurier had a really interesting life. She was born in London to a wealthy family. She was world famous and her career spanned four decades. She had an interesting um, relationship to both gender and sexual orientation. Um, she was very much as a child, she was occasionally quite a tomboy figure. Her father really wanted a boy actually and um, was quite keen on letting her cut her hair short, <clears throat> dress in boys clothes and she nicknamed herself Eric Avon. And um, this was unusual at the time for um the, the kind of environment she was growing up in. She was married with children, but she also had passionate affairs, including relationships with women. And her writing very much recognises the validity of same-sex desire, as well as a more conventional approaches, which were more celebrated at the time. Her work's renowned for its use of Gothic tropes. And... Um, there's also the other thing that's hugely famous in her writing is a real relishing, a savouring of place. She deeply, deeply loved Cornwall. Um, although she grew up in London largely, when she first went to Cornwall as a child, she immediately felt a deep, deep kinship with it. And um, her work has gone on to inspire a great deal of literary tourism because her writing brings a sense of place so vividly. And indeed, we're going to be doing some activities about the way she evokes place in Rebecca in a minute. De Maurier's Cornwall. Um, I'll just throw these slides out here in case people are, want to investigate more about um, her history there. Um, she had a very important experience early on though, in her time there. She was wandering around and having a fun time. Um, and exploring and she happened across an extraordinary house she had to get up to it reach it through a, an overgrown pathway and um, overgrown gardens and this house was Mena Billy um, a, a vast slightly fallen into um, some state of disrepair type, type mansion which very much became the inspiration for Manderley that incredibly incredibly powerfully evoked house in the novel Rebecca Gothic antecedents. What does it mean to say that she has links to a Gothic tradition? Gothic is quite hard to define, but this quotation from the critic Fred Botting gives us a way into it. Um, basically, Fred Botting points out here that although Gothic fiction at the end of the 18th century was rather its own genre following a kind of formulaic sequence and particular plots, in the 19th and 20th and indeed now 21st centuries, Gothic kind of went underground and started inhabiting other genres. An important line I'd like to single out here is, the family became a place rendered threatening by the haunting return of past transgressions. And one would be hard put, I think you'd agree, to see a more apt summary of some of Rebecca's concerns as a novel. Another important thing to realise in the tr tradition of Gothic is that Gothic subjects are fundamentally 
not in control. As Bossing says here, Gothic subjects were alienated, divided from themselves, no longer in control of passions, desires, and fantasies. Writing in a Gothic mode or a Gothic tradition tends to be very much driven by sometimes unconscious passions, intense desires, yearnings, and danger. And again, the novel Rebecca very much deals with these kinds of taboo, desperate states. Um, I thought you might like this slide because it summarizes some very common motifs of the late 18th century Gothic. And in fact, you can see how these two have odd parallels in some of Rebecca's representations. It's true we don't have supernatural figures in the novel, but we do have a strangely vampiric Mrs. Danvers, don't we? It's true we don't have an, a literal um, damsel in distress flitting around the parapet of ancient castles, but we do have a damsel in distress flitting about a, a vast, ruin, vast soon to be ruined mansion. We have dramatic settings, we have strange secrets under the sea that emerge, we have profound violence, we have a lot. So there's all these ways in which this novel was plugging in to that Gothic tradition. But that's not the only thing the novel's connecting to, of course. And another really important antecedent is Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre from 1847. In many ways, the plot is so close that Rebecca itself can be seen as a kind of adaptation of Jane Eyre. Both present a mousy woman of a socially ambiguous class who enters a majestic house becomes attached to a brooding hero, discovers that the first wife is still a threat in some strange, spooky way, whose house burns down, and who then lives with the husband in damaged exile thereafter. And it's extraordinarily close when you put it that way, isn't it, really? And that is not the only previous link. Let's think also about fairy tales. We've got Sleeping Beauty struggling through the briars to reach the ha and the, the prince struggling through the briars to reach the house. We've got Cinderella, an ordinary mousy girl swept up by a wealthy prince. We have Bluebeard, that really scary story about a husband who has dead wives stashed in a secret room. And the other thing, of course, that we have here is popular romance. This is often dismissed as women's fiction. But dismissing that is problematic. I think we need to always be respecting the vitality and vibrance of different literary and criti literary genres. And there's a rather marvellous critical book by Janice Radway called Reading the Romance, which is really, really interesting in this regard, looking at why people read certain kinds of formulaic romance fiction and respecting something about what people are getting out of it. In this vein, I'd also single out, for example, the extraordinary success and importance of archive of our own and popular contemporary writing forums reaching millions and millions of readers. Fanfic, shipping, all of this, this is valid art form and um, really deserves study and thinking about, even if we don't usually have them on syllabi. So I want now to consider two arguments here. And I'd like you to be listening to this and thinking critically about what you would say if you were choosing one of these to write an essay about on Rebecca. Both can absolutely be argued. I'm sure you could write a great essay for either of these topics, but I want you to choose the one that strikes a chord with you and to be thinking about that. The first argument would be Rebecca is a formulaic romance perpetuating negative gender stereotypes. The opposite argument would be Rebecca actually subversively challenges the era's stereotypical assumptions about gender. Both of these are terrific arguments. They could both produce amazing work for A-level or university. Your task now is to listen to me talking through some of the evidence for each of these sides and forge your own perspective. Which of these is most persuasive to you? 
as I'm talking, are there particular passages in the novel that you're thinking of? Are you thinking, oh, Sarah, fair point, but you're forgetting paragraph this. You're forgetting what happens in this chapter. That's great if you think that. Be trying to listen critically and disagree with me. Think of sections which put pressure against what I'm talking about. And I'd also like you to be thinking as you're listening about what themes you might like to pick up and develop in an adaptation you might do. At the end, we'll do an activity around that as well. I know some of you are creative writers. Perhaps you work in art forms of poetry, perhaps fiction, perhaps you're thinking of film or games, video games, all of these valid narrative art forms. So these are things to think about as I talk through these next slides and activities. And at the end of this session, we'll come back to this question and ask you to think about what you would choose out of those two arguments. There are, of course, many other things one could say. These are just two out of many. Okay, evidence it's a formulaic romance perpetuating gender stereotypes. Well, first bit of evidence, the narrator thinks it is. This is quite revealing and obviously quite powerful evidence. So, thinking through this, she says it has a happy ending. In chapter two, she says, we have no secrets now from one another. That sounds idyllic. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? What a united pair they are. Perhaps I might throw that into question a bit later on, but she certainly says there that it's a happy ending. It has the trappings of popular romance, the mysterious hero, a giant house, a Cinderella motif. These are very common in popular romance. So those could absolutely, you could quote from passages which, are, which have those elements, and you could show that those are fitting popular romance tropes. It's extremely melodramatic, and I'm not using that as a critic, as a scornful term. I'm using it kind of technically to describe that, how it's very lurid and quite intense and emotional. The characters are rather one-dimensional and caricatured. Um, that's often said. I'm not entirely sure I agree with that argument myself, but I can see its point. And after all, Mrs. Danvers, she is a figure of pure menace. You can't imagine her unwinding with some knitting or giving birthday presents for a relative or um, chilling with a friend. Her job seems to mainly be to drift broodingly along dark corridors and utter menacing statements. So there's a sense that possibly characters are somewhat one-dimensional. You could also argue that it reinforces glib gender stereotypes. The women in the novel are either very passive wimps, frankly, or monstrous and diabolical. Those seem to be the only two options available to women within the novel, some people might say. I'm, again, not entirely sure I agree with that, but you could certainly make a very, very strong argument for it. And then some people have said, not much of a writer, jar with jarring infelicities. Um, ignore the web CT comment on that. Um, John Mullen's article is going to be linked in the lecture references at the end of these slides that you can look at there. He is not convinced by the idea that Du Maurier's writing is brilliant. Okay, so I've gone quite quickly through the evidence for it being a formulaic romance. I now want to lean a bit into a more difficult argument, one that Rebecca might be a subversive novel challenging the era's stereotypical assumptions about gender. Now, I'm going to spend a lot more time on this one, but that doesn't mean it's more valid as an argument. It's more that it's not the most obvious argument, and so I want to do the work to prove it. But you could absolutely argue the opposite, and in fact, I probably would tomorrow. I just happen today to be feeling more like I want to argue this. And that's one of the things about literary study, that you can and should work out your position and make the case for it. And this is incredibly useful from an employability perspective because looking into future jobs, you're going to always, always, regardless of what sector you enter, going to be needing to make a powerful case for your own interpretation. This is always the case. And literature and a literature degree gives you amazing preparation for that. It might just sound like we're talking about Rebecca, a novel by Daphne du Maurier here. Who cares? Actually, we're developing analytic skills that are going to translate in incredibly powerful ways to a vast array of careers afterwards. Okay, 
So let me offer this more difficult argument. I'm going to be arguing that it does subvert and challenge stereotypical assumptions about gender, and that it achieves this through the way it represents Mandalay, the narrator, Rebecca, a preoccupation with text and writing, evocative depictions of obsession and non-normative sexuality, and a, perhaps, not actually, happy ending. But first, I want to ask you a question. Which character in the novel interested you most, and why? I'd like you to pause this narration now, take a moment to write your answer, find quotations in the story to support your answer. Why is the one out of these five that you've chosen the most interesting and all are valid? And yes, I do mean the house in number one. Would you choose Mandalay, the narrator, Max de Winter, Rebecca, or Mrs. Danvers? All of them are totally valid. You take a moment now, write down what you choose. Hopefully you took that time to write down your answer. I wish I could see what you'd written. I'm going to go through now each of these and say a little bit about them. Maybe you can guess as you're listening to me talking which one I like best. <laughs> okay, feminine personification of Mandalay. It's an extraordinary house, isn't it? Notice the menace of the overgrown wood. It's personified and specifically personified as feminine. Quote in chapter one, Nature had come into her own again, and little by little, in her stealthy, insidious way, had encroached upon the drive with long, tenacious fingers. Nature often is personified as female, and in this case, it's for kind of like a witch figure. The beeches, I'm reading again from chapter one, with their white naked limbs lent close to one another, their branches intermingled in a strange embrace and the hydrangeas rear to monster height. There are hints of torture and pain. We hear of squat oaks and tortured elms in chapter one, and the gnarled root looks like skeleton claws. And together these things make us think of bodies extended and racked in anguish. And again to quote, the malevolent ivy had thrown her tendrils around the pair of trees and made them prisoner. Now this is about the wood around Mandalay and the flowers and plants there. Um, so they're really, really strange and inspiring and they foreshadow so much that happens in the rest of the novel and no more so than the very, very strange rhododendrons. Chapter one again. The rhododendrons had entered into alien marriages with a host of nameless shrubs, poor bastard things that clung about their roots as though conscious of their spurious origin. A lilac had mated with a copper beech. So these images of dark hungers, of kind of non-normative reproduction, all of these end up becoming very important for the representation of Rebecca herself later. And the critic Nicola Watson says that what we off we're offered here in Mandalay is a nightmare perversion of orderly domesticity. From this opening, we can guess this will be a novel in which the domestic, marital and legitimate will be threatened. Which, of course, is exactly what happens. Okay. Perhaps you chose the narrator, who is arguably... Well, she's nameless. She is nameless. We do know some things about her name, though, don't we? What do we know about her name? We know three things. Um, we know that it is lovely and unusual and hard to spell. And of course, she does get a name in the end, doesn't she? She's Mrs. De Winter. It feels strange to call her that, though, doesn't it? Because the Mrs. De Winter we're so aware of during the novel is not her. So the whole idea of the name around the narrator is really, really fascinating. And her strangely blank name is paralleled by a strangely blank life. Quote, nothing much has happened to me apart from people dying. She's defined by absence and loss. And as such, she's a useful placeholder for unmasking period ideas of conventional passive femininity. She has an unsettling relationship with Max. 
There's a weird kind of patronising, almost father-child relation. He likes how innocent she is, and he orders her around like a child, says things like, run along to her. And he says at one point that being a husband's a bit like being a father. That's chapter 16. Very, very troubling. There's also some ambivalence around domesticity. She feels really happy when she escapes to Happy Valley a few pages into chapter 13. Now that Maxime was safe in London and I had eaten my biscuits, I felt very well and curiously happy. Um, and then she rather wish she talks later, a few pages later, about how happy she is to be by herself, but then, oh, I did not mean that. It was disloyal, wicked. Max was my life and my world. Yeah, okay. Perhaps actually, maybe Max is not the best for you. You know, there's this real sense of one wanting a friend to intervene um, in this poor, great situation at certain moments. Saying something about this then, to contextualise where she's at, the reality of middle-class women's position in 1938, and of course, like Jane Eyre, the narrator is financially incredibly precarious position. At the beginning of the novel, she's a companion, having to put up with an incredibly unpleasant wealthy woman's every woman and move without any financial security. Um, now, obviously, there are a lot of things that had happened that were good at this time. Women had acquired the vote, but they were not actually fully on equal terms with men until 1928. There was a Sex Disqualification Removal Act, which meant that legally, after 1919, they could enter any profession, but professions themselves still set up barriers. So, for example, school teachers were supposed to leave teaching as they got married. In December 1941, conscription began for women into war work, and they entered industry and munitions factories and all kinds of things. But after the war, a colossal drive happened to get women back into houses again. Really interesting book about this by Denise Riley. You can see in the bibliography at the end of the slides. There's a lot of pressure against married women working, especially if they had children. Women were often also unable to inherit. And the ideology of reproductive, normative, heterosexual, cis femininity remained hugely influential. And you can see again writing by Modleski, Leiden, Miller to explore this more. Christine Miller summarises, Since the 19th century, middle-class English culture had conceived of the home as a private haven from the economic and political aggression of the public sphere and gendered those divisions. And the early 20th century and indeed the mid-20th century and wartime were absolutely not free of those attitudes. I'm showing you this really shocking poster now just to capture how misogyny was really soaked into even government rhetoric. This is a government produced poster which was trying to raise awareness among men of sexual disease um, during the war. The quote, easy girlfriend spread syphilis and gonorrhea. And we've got a skull wearing a pink hat, very gendered skull there. And the lines, hello boyfriend, coming my way? This idea of a seductive, deadly femme fatale is incredibly sexist and problematic because, of course, one could equally say that the man who happened to be engaging with more sexual partners was just as responsible. Yet this was putting the responsibility for certain kinds of behaviour on women only. And, of course, that's not changed today either that much. Um, but this very egregious example it really, I always think of this when I read Rebecca, I remember this chilling poster, and the way that the novel itself acts around Rebecca's own sexuality. So let's talk about that. Perhaps when you did that question, you chose the representation of Rebecca herself as particularly interesting to you. There are lots of ways that although Rebecca is not in the novel technically, she is in the novel in every page. The ways she appears are as follows. She appears through her own handwriting, and I've got a picture here on the screen of one of the covers of Rebecca, which have has the image R, that big swooping, confident, flourishing R that is her writing. Um, she first, the narrator first sees Rebecca's name on the flyleaf of the book of poetry she finds in Max's car at the end of chapter four. Inside the cover, Rebecca had written Max from Rebecca, and the handwriting makes a huge impression on the mousy narrator. 
She says, quote, It is written in a curious, slanting hand. A little blob of ink marred the white page opposite, as though the writer, in impatience, had shaken her pen to make the ink flow freely. The name Rebecca stood out black and strong, the tall and sloping R dwarfing the other letters. That's the end of chapter four. Um, and the first time Mouse says her name, I call her Mouse, the first time the narrator, I keep calling her Mouse because she kind of is, the first time she says her name, quote, the word magnified itself into something hyenas and appalling, and it conjured up an image of her signature. That's chapter five. So it's almost as if saying the word conjures, invokes like a spiritual force, a sense of her writing. The end of chapter five is also haunted by a vision of Rebecca's signature, that bold, slanting hand. And the book accidentally opens at the title page when the narrator is packing after Mount Max's proposal. And she thinks in chapter six, how alive was her writing, how full of force. And the narrator, in desperation, burns that page of writing. But somehow something goes wrong when she does that. And this is chapter six again. The letter R was the last to go. It twisted in the flame. It curled outwards for a moment, becoming larger than ever. This is spooky writing, right? This is writing with a, literally a life of its own, an afterlife of its own. And there's a lot of difference between the narrator's writing and Rebecca's. At the end of chapter eight, quote, I noticed for the first time how cramped was my own handwriting without individuality. Very different from Rebecca. But writing isn't the only way Rebecca's president, present, <laughs> president, present. Look at the rhododendrons, those strange flowers, chapter seven. The first time the narrator sees them, she really freaks out. She says, we were among the rhododendrons. There was something bewildering, shocking about the suddenness of their discovery. Massed one upon the other in incredible profusion, showing no leaf, no twig, nothing but the slaughterous red, luscious and fantastic, unlike any rhododendron plant I had seen before. To me, a rhododendron was a homely domestic thing, strictly conventional. But these were monsters. Too beautiful, I thought, too powerful. They were not plants at all. She's right, they're not really just plants, are they? They're Rebecca. They're evocative and symbolic of Rebecca, her beautiful, sensual, shocking energy and refusal to follow conventional forms. Are you guessing yet? The one I enjoy most? <laughs> She resists the reproductive decree. She defies lineage. Why does Max kill Rebecca? Do you remember? Yes. She told him she was pregnant by another man and that she expected him to raise her child as his heir. Her astonishing cheek was to defy the law of primogeniture. That is what she did. Now, she wasn't actually pregnant, but the, she knew what it what how Max would respond to that with murderous rage and annihilation. She was flagrantly saying that she would be willing to break that law of um, marital fidelity. So I want to say a little bit now, since we've been talking about Rebecca and sensual desire and the unconventional, um, the novel Rebecca and the film, particularly the Hitchcock film adaptation, um, makes a great deal of Mrs. Danvers' obsession with Rebecca, which is very much presented in very sensual terms. She's a vampiric and skeletal figure. In chapter 7 we hear she's tall and gaunt, dressed in deep black, with prominent cheekbones and great hollow eyes, giving her a skull's face, parchment white, set on a skeleton's frame. And she relishes the memory of Rebecca's violence against the horse, talking about how she loved, in chapter 18, loved to see Rebecca um, kind of torture the horse almost with blood and sweat from the spurs and from forcing it to ride. So there are all kinds of ways that Mrs. Danville, or Miss Danvers also almost tempts the narrator to suicide. She's a deeply scary figure, very malevolent. Um, and there are lots of ways in which the novel fits into a tradition that can be called the vampiric lesbian narrative. And these are very problematic narratives and very often very homophobic traditionally. They somehow are implying 
that women's desire for other women is unnatural, is wrong. And of course, that is a very old-fashioned and ridiculous way of thinking. I think we can all agree that that's an inappropriate way to talk about completely valid sexual desire and romantic love for the same sex. But for a long time, um, this was very, uh, very difficult to represent. In fact, illegal to represent on film when Hitchcock was making that film. So, um, and there were lots of ways that certain kinds of coded imagery got used to describe it. And one of them was this image of the kind of almost vampiric desire. But you know what? It's true that Mrs. Danvers is not the only one who is fascinated with Rebecca's body. The narrator is. How about the end of chapter seven, when she's sitting in a chair and she suddenly realizes Rebecca must have sat there? Quote, it came to me that I was not the first one to lounge there in possession of the chair. Someone had been there before me, had surely left an imprint of their person on the cushions and on the arm where her hand had rested. Another hand had poured the coffee from the same silver pot, had placed the cup to her lips. That's the very end of chapter seven. Another time, the narrator puts the raincoat on in a hurry and then later on realises when she puts her hands in her pocket that it's Rebecca's. And she realises, again, she, that she falls into a reverie about Rebecca herself. In chapter 11, Rebecca's lipstick, Rebecca's shoulders, Rebecca's perfume, they all fascinate the narrator. And then... When the narrator does dare to venture into the wing that had been Rebecca's, she feels excited, her heart beating fast in a strange way. She says, my heart beating in a queer, excited way. That's chapter 13. She finds Rebecca's nightgown and she strokes it sensuously. She strokes it in the Hitchcock adaptation. It's more Danvers. But in the novel, it's the narrator who's stroking Rebecca's nightgowns and satins. She imagines Max brushing Rebecca's hair and Rebecca saying, harder, harder. That's chapter 14. This is quite erotic writing and it's the narrator's perspective. So Danvers is not the only person to be thinking about. There are many, many other examples of ways in which the narrator's own desire um, influences this novel. Look particularly at chapter four. Um, there's a moment when she thinks reading about as a child reading books about sexuality and she remembers quote that sick unhealthy feeling I had experienced as a child when turning the pages of a forbidden book she equates her burgeoning heterosexual desire for Max actually with feeling ill and unhealthy there are lots of ways that sexuality altogether in this book for the narrator is rather problematic she struggles with it yet she is fascinated by Rebecca there's absolutely no doubt about that. Okay, so the last part of my suggestion of that second argument deals with the question of is the ending happy? Well, on the one hand she says they are, but on the other hand we have to raise our eyebrows slightly because it's, hooray, my husband's a murderer. She's just found out that, okay, Rebecca's not a threat since she's dead, but and, uh, and Max killed her, but on the other hand, Max killed her, and quite how thrilling and reassuring it is to be married to murder is up for grabs. They're exiled from Mandalay in Britain. They're estranged from each other. And in the first version of the novel, the ending was absolutely horrifying, very disturbing indeed. Um, and you can read this, if you're curious, in the um, book by de Maurier called The Rebecca Notebook and Other Memories. I won't give you a sneak preview, but you can find it if you like. He's crippled and scarred, much like Mr. Rochester in Jane Eyre, and things are just altogether very distressing. So, it's not neat closure. Remember that famous first line? Last night I dreamed I went to Mandalay again. Mandalay's still where she wants to be. It's where he still wants to be. It's where they all want to be. That house is a compelling, compelling sight. So if you were trying to guess which one I was most excited about in that choice, it's Rebecca with a close second from Mandalay as character. But all the responses are valid because as we can see, each of them has so much to say about. Okay, so I've offered you two arguments there. Nina Auerbach goes for the second one. 
She argues that the brutal tales of Du Maurier's novels generally are not in the common sense romances. Remember, she's arguing this, right? So she's making a case. You can disagree with it. Technically, they're hardly romances at all. It's not soothing and tender, she says. She says at the end, if Du Maurier writes romances at all, their achievement is to infuse with menace the kind of life women are supposed to want. That's a very strong statement there from Auerbach. See what you think. And there are also ways that the novel arguably subverts class. Now, the narrator has an ambiguous class position. She's a paid companion like Jane Eyre. Max is cruel, actually, in a way. He expects her to be socially accomplished, but does not teach her. And she struggles with that so very much. So many humiliations. For example, when Giles and others come to have dinner, Max assumes she'll know what to do. Chapter 9, and he frowns and looks restless and impatient, and it's because she doesn't realise she should rise and lead them away. And poor narrator gets up at once when she does realise. That's chapter 9. By contrast, Rebecca is quintessentially aristocratic, socially accomplished, and really, really familiar with those particular social norms. Max's mother praises Rebecca's breeding, brains, and beauty. And the narrator is very conscious she doesn't seem to have any of those things in that sense. The narrator also has class prejudice. She dislikes Mrs. Danvers' voice, Roy, voice as intimate and unpleasant, unquote. She doesn't like it when working-class women try to be friends with her. When she meets Rebecca's cousin and lover, Favel, chapter 16, she thinks some people would consider him attractive. Girls in sweet shops giggling behind a counter and girls who gave one the programmes in a cinema. That is an incredibly classist statement. The narrator is very, very class prejudiced herself, even if her own class is highly ambiguous. She's also equating in that line working class women with sexual availability and lack of discretion. So I would say that there's a lot going on in the novel that's subversive and unpredictable. And that although it's very formulaic, there are also ways that it's actually quite subversive. But you can also absolutely argue that the formulaic elements outweigh the others. So I'd like you to pause a moment now, the, sli the slides again, and think about the evidence I've given. Think about evidence you've thought of. I'm sure I've missed things. So think about paragraphs, chapters, lines, sentences, and jot down which of these you would choose and perhaps a couple of things, a few notes you might make if you are perhaps ready to write an essay about those in an exam. Then when you've done that, return to the slides. Okay, hi. Right, we're back. And now we're going to be going on to... the next activity, although I might actually put that into a separate separate recording, I think, because we're running out of space on this one. I hope you enjoyed this recording. I'll be seeing you again in the next. Thank you.